So um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is not going to be a selling presentation about anything, OK? So just to be clear, my name is Victor Rodriguez. I'm from Mexico. I work in Intel. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an OpenStack developer. Uh, I would like to be. But yes, this is not going to be an OpenStack developer presentation. This is the point of view how um, compiler and OS developer guy try to help to improve the performance of the cloud. So what we are going to learn, what I'm trying to show in this presentation is how the latest technology of the compilers can improve the performance of many of the applications that are running in the cloud. Okay? Uh, there is a lot of um, background history of how, how difficult it is to change one compiler version to another compiler version in the operating system that are running on the servers that we use for OpenStax application. However, there are really good benefits of changing one compiler to other, despite of the effort that you need to do. So I will try to encourage you to change the latest version of the compiler. So what is going to be the agenda for this? Um, unused resources. How many resources do we have and how we are not using those resources in our servers? Uh, AVX technology is one of, great, one of the great examples. Function multiversioning is a way to solve those kind of problems. And the profiling is another way to solve the problem of the unused resources that we have in our data centers. There it is. So unused resources, nobody wants to be there, OK? If you're in a traffic jam, if there is a free line that you can take, and you might be wondering why I'm not taking that free line if I am stuck in the traffic. Why if there is a free line and I might go faster or this traffic could be avoided, why I'm still here? Why, why, why nobody change a path and, and make the things much more efficient like in the picture that we can see? Unused resources is something that is really typical in the server area that we have. Intel architect technology is, has been there for years. One of the greatest examples that we have is the advanced vector uh, extension technology. The history of computing power. This is a picture that I take from one of my favorite books. Um, there is the side, uh, it's Hennessy Patterson, Architecture, a Quantity Approach. And the history of computing power has been, was amazing in the 90s, 20s, and it was impressive. We have 52% of increase in the performance of uh, data centers per year. Okay, and that was amazing. What happened in 2004, something, somebody can remember that thing. I mean, we were just increasing the speed of the CPU clock, and that was amazing. But suddenly, we realized that the power consumption was not that amazing at that moment, you know? And that was when the birth of a parallel computer came. Uh, some of you actually were in some meetings that were, we were wondering, hey, what is going to be, what is going to happen with Intel when they cannot support the increase of a frequency clock anymore? Um, well, the birth of a parallel computing. Now, that was a change in the history that created a new paradigm to how to build computers, how to build data centers, how to create a software to manage them from operating system, compilers, and application. So what happened next? What happened with the growth of the, of the computers since then? The growth has been amazing due to the fact or the capability that we have to increase the number of processors in a data centers. That is amazing. But the question is, are we using really that power in our data centers? Are we using those new instruction sets that the Intel architecture or any other architecture is providing to us? Um, and this is a really good example. The Intel floating point roadmap. OK, we started with four bits in 2008, 2010. We doubled the size of the array to 2011, 2012, and it was amazing. You know, we have much more folding point capabilities, and it was amazing for the HPC system, for the uh, all the analytics that we can do for calculating the weather or the forecast or whatever you want to do. That was amazing, and that was a huge advantage. What changed later? Well, 2013, 2014, we doubled again, and we, we were, the size of the array that we can manage was 60 bits. And last year, sirs, it was 32 bits. OK. That it, so the question here is, why Intel is so worried to increase that huge size of the array? Why, why he is providing us an Intel architecture with new, with new arrays much more um, bigger, or, or where they can manage much more floating points? So, here is a simple example. Uh, taking that simple example that actually just add to arrays in, in C and do that thing for like many times, I need to do that because it was really fast in the beginning. Um, so the question is, what is happening in the back of that? It's just adding one array to another and putting the results into a third array, which is pretty simple. Well, 
the birth of the vectorization came with that simple problem. Imagine that you have the same code that it was in the previous slide, so you have, you, you can do without vectorization or before the vectorization technology came in 2008, you just have these, addition of one element to another and put the, the solution into, the, into another um, register of the CPU was fine. But what happened with the others uh, free part of the, reg of the register? You are in use of that. That is what I mean with unused resources. You're not using the full capability of your, um, uh, of this instruction set, okay? So what happened if I put the array that I have and coming back to our previous example, now I will add the first element of the array, the second element of the array, the third and the fourth, and I will do the addition in parallel in one cycle just in, in one uh, clock cycle and put the, the solution against in my, in, my in my register, in my CPU. So that will decrease the, time, the execution time four times, okay? Instead of, in the previous slide, sorry, doing this one time every time in, in, in all the 2016, in, in all the, the four that I have, what I have here is I do all the additions four in one clock cycle one time, okay? So I save four clock cycles every time that I'm doing this addition. So the execution time will be reduced by four times. So that is amazing. How do I enable vectorization in GCC? Okay, uh, this is something that has been like for years and it's really simple. You just need to add the minus O2 or F3 vectorize, okay? Or if you put the O3. Um, I know that OpenStack isn't built in, 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 in Python, but there are some cases that where you, um, and this is, with the libraries that we are using in the back of that might be built in C or might be compiled in C. Many of the libraries that we are using uh, in the top of, of the OpenStack application might be built in C. And we will see some examples, nice examples. So taking the, exa the previous code that we saw before, without vectorization, just doing, sorry, this execution way, it took 600 milliseconds. Just that simple code that we saw before. When I enable vectorization, that reduces the time to 38 milliseconds, okay? And that is just, again, for using another flag. So you might be wondering, okay, that is cool. I can reduce the time of my application in terms of execution time, which means that the workload that I put in the cloud might be a little bit slower. So this is something that the HPC guys knows very well, and that's many of the things that they use every day. So what happened with AVX2? Okay, coming back to the graph with a floating point roadmap, we had four bits first, then eight bits, then 16, and now we have 32. The last 32 is the AVX3, okay? Is the AVX52 uh, long register uh, interlock detectors, new features that we have since last year in, in, the, in the latest servers, and that was fine. Um, the AVX52 was, uh, it, it has a capacity for 52, um, from zero to 511, AVX2 can support a race of, of from zero to 255, and the regular one that we used to show before, just with a simple vectorization thing, it goes with register from zero to 127. What does it mean? The instruction set is that that long. So what happened with AVX2? I have much more register. I have uh, longer space, so I can, in the example that, that we saw before, do the addition of the of the elements of the RAID in par much more in parallel. The only thing that you have to add is the MAVX2 flag, and that's all the things that you have to add, okay? That's all the things that you have to add to enable the AVX2 technology. And before, without using that flag, you were not using the resources that was in the Intel architecture. So imagine that you are a CPU and you're a compiler, and the compiler generated a binary that is not using the full capability of the Intel architecture or of the, of the server. So the CPU will say, okay, I can run this thing, but if you just add that flag, I can run it faster. How much more fast? Okay, this is without any kind of vectorization. 63 milliseconds with just a simple vectorization, it reduced to 38 milliseconds. With AVX2 technology, it reduced to 26 milliseconds, okay? So that is a huge reduction in terms of execution time for using just one compiler flag. I know that it's part of the, what, of the, what the operating systems should be doing, but the question is, does the operating system that is running your OpenStack has that enabled in the libraries that you're using? Because me as an OpenStack user, 
And I, that's something that happened with my team. I have, I'm, I'm in the compiler and the power performance team, and there is another team that is in charge of the open stack. And they don't care about how do I do this as long as they see the workload in OpenStack run faster. So what kind of workloads go faster? Real case example number one. That is a new, well, not that new um, programming language that came out to the world a few years ago, right? Many, well, right, can somebody please surprise the hand if you know what our programming language does? Great. So what is it used for? We use it for analytics. We use it for um, big data analysis, for statistics. It's amazing. The way that they manage the graphs and the plots, it's amazing. And the way that you can do a linear regression is really simple. So it's something that the cloud use, right? I mean, something that the cloud workloads or data center workloads might be using. So this is a benchmark that I've, it wasn't done by Intel. It was done by an external third party magazine. The name is Pharonix. And that magazine usually take all the operating systems that they want, that they choose, and run benchmark on the top of it, and measure the performance of the operating system, and give the reason why one benchmark is better than the other. So they said, I want to analyze how fast is your clear Linux operation. Clear Linux is the pro. Sorry. <laughs> Clear Linux is the project where we work, and this is the project where we are enabling all these patches. Oh, <laughs> it's not my fault, right? I mean, no. We can, can you see the screen now, right? Yeah. There you are. Thank you. So, Clear Linux, coming back to the presentation, is the operating system where we work, okay? It's an operating system made for, by Intel to highlight many of the Intel architecture features that are not being used by any other operating system, okay? It's not, yeah. It's not, um, we're not trying to compete with Red Hat or Fedora or Ubuntu. On the other hand, we're trying to provide the, open, the, the operating system uh, partners patches so that they can use this technology, so that they can use AVX in their operating system, and the, any user of the, of the other operating system can benefit from that. So that is one thing that I want to, to clear. So they took Clear Linux and they compare it uh, to other operating systems, Ubuntu, SUSE, and Fedora, as far as I can see. Lower is better, and it's three times faster the way that the R script can run, the, their uh, benchmark can run you know, in Clear Linux by the use of AVX2, okay? The patches are available. I put the link in, in the QR code so that you can go to there, and that, that's the link for the actual article of Pharonix, and you can go and read, and they explain, and they link to the source code that make that benchmark run faster, okay? It's nothing really complicated. It's just one single patch that you need to change in one file, and that thing will make Ubuntu or Red Hat or Fedora run at the same speed, and we have, we have tested. So if AVX is so cool, and we can see with the results that it's one thing that it's really powerful for me as a, as, as a developer of cloud technology, because I don't care what happened in the, in the back, as long as the benchmark runs faster for me, it's fine. Why nobody use it? I mean, it has been there for years ago. Why nobody use that technology since, since, since it's been there for years? Well. How many binaries do I have to deploy? Because if I compile for AVX2 flag, I have one binary. If I compile for AVX3, I have another binary. And if I compile for SSC, I have yet another binary. So at least now I have three binaries. So imagine the path that you will have in user being uh, and your AVX3, or user leaves 64, AVX2, AVX3, and SSC, it will be really hard to manage, and it will be a nightmare for the OS developer to try to manage and to, to deploy all the binaries, and they have to compile the three binaries every time that they do a new release. So that is a nightmare. So why nobody use that? Well, it's because of that, because it's a nightmare to use it. GCC 6, which is going to be released the next week, just, um, that, that, is, that is truly a commercial. I'm, I'm part of the GCC team, and that is truly a commercial. GCC 6 finally see the light in the next week. And 
release this new technology. It's function multiversioning for C. Before it was just for C++, now it's available for C. And you just need to specify in the same function that we had before the targets that you want that this function be optimized for. Okay, so that is the only change that you have to do inside your code. You just need to specify, okay, I want this code to be optimized for Atom, for SLM, and for ABX2. Okay, so at the end, you will have a binary with the three different kind of instruction set in assembly. When you do the, oh, sorry. So it's broken, right? No, it's fine. No, it's fine, it's fine, don't worry. So um, we have at the end a binary with three different assembly instruction there. When you do the object dump and open the binary, you will see the instruction set optimized for SSE, for AVX, and for AVX2. So that will be amazing, because on the runtime, your binary will detect what hardware am I? Oh, am I in the latest a server, Xeon, that, my, that this company has? Oh, so I can run with ABX2 or ABX3, okay? The, over, the overhead, uh, somebody might be wondering, what is the overhead of this thing? The overhead is just in, in the size of the binary. It increased 30%. Uh, we're, just in, we're in our way to, to write a, an article about all the details and, in, and much more details about what is going to be there. Uh, however, you can find all the information in the blogs of clearlinux.org. And that link is all the information inside and the detailed patches of what happened. So that's the first thing. Use the unused resources that you have. The second thing is, and I put the picture about traffic because I truly hate traffic. And I try to avoid traffic as much as anyone else. So I'm a big fan of working from home, by the way. Um, help the compiler find the most efficient path. If you see the picture there you, and you're new in the city, it's like when you go to LA, right? You try to go in the highway to in, in, in LA, and the first time that I arrived there with my car, it was like, okay, I'm lost. 15 minutes later, I, 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 was, I, I had no idea where I was. So find the compiler to find the right path. Who knows better what your code should do than you? Nobody, okay? I was in, in, in the Metal Linux conference four weeks ago, and there was a discussion about the compiler was not smart enough. And at the end, somebody asked the question, well, the compiler is just a tool that we use to generate from, source, from the source code that we have a binary. But the smart guy in the middle, it's us. Profiling is something that is not new. Profiling has been there since years. There are two kinds of profiling. That is what is new in the latest version of GCC. Profiling in the old times was using as an invasive profiling, okay? There is an advantage, it's very precise, okay? And I'm going to try to do an, uh, an analogy, really good analogy that I, I found weeks ago. There is a disadvantage, it has a high overhead, yes, it has a high, high overhead. Non-invasive profiling has its a small overhead, but the disadvantage is not as, it's not as really accurate as the other one. I and mean, here comes the analogy. Um, imagine that you, uh, you want to track the performance of one player in a soccer match. Okay, what do you, what, let's see that we have two options. Option first, we will put a huge pencil in the back of the soccer player, and that his smart pencil is gonna send information to the server with OpenStack of where the player has been running during the match in the, in, 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 in the field, okay? And in the end, we will see a nice animation of where the player has been running around all the match. That is amazing, okay? It's really accurate. You know where exactly the, 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 the guy has been running all the game. The problem is that he has a huge pencil in the back, right? That's the only problem. That is the thing with profiling, the, the invasive profiling. You have to put something inside the code that can track you where the code has been running during the execution of the binary. What happened with the non-invasive profiling? Not in basic profiling, same example. You put them, you, instead of putting something to the, to the guy in the back, you put sensors across the, all over the field. And you start to measure how many times the player has been act, uh, activating those sensors. At the end, you have counters. And maybe with the counters, you can realize what are the fields of the match, of the, uh, what are the parts of the field that the, the game, that the player has been touching more. 
which is cool. And you have the capability to more or less guess what parts are the ones that he run more, in what time. So you can guess a little bit more about it. So that, those are the two differences between invasive profiling and non invasive profiling. Both are excellent. Both are great for some cases or for some others. This is an example with invasive profiling, OK? With invasive profiling, we do PGO uh, to, uh, profiling for MariaDB. And what we did was, OK, first we took MariaDB and we compiled MariaDB with instrumented. Then we run the benchmark. And after the benchmark, we gather all the information of where Maria has been, taught, has been um, executed or exercised it after the benchmark. And with that information, we pass that, pass that information to the compiler and said, OK, compiler, this is the information of what are the paths are the branches that are more, they're most executed by, by the benchmark of Maria. And this is a regular benchmark that many guys in the cloud and the data center use. So the compiler takes that information and he says, OK, now I know what do you care more. Now I can predict in a better way the branches that I'm going to compile. Now I can manage in a better way the memory. And where can I put the, the, the variables into the heap in a better way so that you can access them, the ones that you use more faster, which is nice. So the compiler now knows a little bit much more information. And as you can see, the performance improvement um, is way much better with the profiling thing, like around 20, 20, 20 80 percent. Another example, oh, by the way, what we, have, what we did later after that is we put Maria in an open stack environment, and we started to run Rally Benchmark. This is one of the Rally Benchmark that, that does transaction per second Rally. I, 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 I hope that, well, I, I think that I'm the only one that was not aware of Rally. Rally is one of the test, um, is the benchmark test suite that OpenStack provides to measure the performance of some stops. This is a transaction per second, and the previous one, sorry is the response time. And yes, it was much more better with the use of profiling. And Maria was running faster in, at the end. So what happened with, when we, um, yeah, this is the, the, the results. Um, in the end, the, the average time to create 100 users running 1,000 time with PGO is 600, um, I think this is milliseconds. And in, with the baseline, could be 7,000 milliseconds. So yes, in the end, when you ask me as an OpenStack user or administrator, what is, it, what is that for me? It's a reduction in time of uh, the, time, the average time that you can create 100 users, 1,000 users, which is nice, because at the end, you can create a user in a less time. What happened with the non-profiling, um, non-invasive profiling technology? Non-invasive profiling technology. We tested in AWK. Okay. AWK, yes, it's old. It has been there since Unix. But it's something that it's still being used by many guys in the industry. And believe it or not, I was in shock when I realized that it, it is pretty much used. So what we did was to run not in basic profiling in, an AB, in AWK. And at the end, we realized that AWK can be improved by 80% just by using not in basic profiling. And in the end, if your operating system can run AWK uh, scripts way much more faster, you can discover the path that you're trying to find in your huge text in a faster way. What is the call of action? One of the things that I want to close the presentation. Um, make the cloud faster. And it's not for an, for, from the point of view of an OpenStack developer. I like this picture because it reminds me of a picture that I saw once in, in a pier in San Francisco where it was completely fog, foggy, and you, it was really hard to walk through. You know that there was a path in the bridge that you can just go and start to walk, but you start to walk slowly. If you start to turn on lights, it's much more faster for you to walk through the cloud. Okay? So it's exactly the same here. Request to your operating system provider to enable the latest technology so that you can, your application can run faster. It's not difficult. It's not really rocket science. It's very simple. So at the end, you, as an OpenStack developer, you can request to your, open, to your operating system provider to enable that technology and make your application run faster through the cloud. Well, that's all. Thank you.
So yeah, questions? Sure. Um, I guess it's an implementation detail question about the multi-targeted architecture. The function multi-version, yeah. So um, like I know with Mac OS 10, they have very long have had multi-architecture binaries, Mac O. So Linux, in my understanding, really hasn't dealt well, as you explained, with multi-architecture uh, multi binaries. Is this part of like the Fat Elf project you're talking about here? I mean, no. Is there something different that, how is it going to know if it's what architecture to, to run if you have sort of this fat binary with multiple optimizations in it? Yeah, the function multiversioning, and I was in, 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 in I was co-working with the Russia team in GCC that did that part. Mm -hmm. Okay, here, here comes the patch. At the end, they, they detect there is a target clone, three target clones, and they generate all the assembly instruction for the three of them. They put it into a piece of memory, and in the, at the end, they, call, they, they use a system call for get CPU ID. And based it on the get CPU ID, they can detect, OK, if it matched with the, with the things that I have, I can go there. But they usually go with the calls, the, the CPU ID func uh, system call. Okay. That's pretty fast. Okay. Before this patch, the way that function multiversioning was working in C++ was kind of a list. They, what they did before was, OK, I have AVX3, AVX2, and AVX1. I'm going to put in the higher priority AVX1. If I don't have AV, sorry, AVX3, if I don't have AVX3, then I go with AVX2. And they were guessing. So the switching between those was really, really slow. Hmm. So that was the way that it was. But now it's with the, the function call, and it's much more faster. Cool. Right. Yeah. Thank you. More than welcome. Sure. Uh, thank you. It's a good presentation. So I thank have you. one question. So if we want to optimize or we want to make our programs running faster, even, uh, specifically for the OpenStack programs and for the cloud computing uh, systems, so shall we use uh, the, the uh, what is specific to some algorithms, we must uh, use, use them to optimize our systems? That's a great question. And, and just. Let me give you an example of when I was starting with this. Yeah. When I was starting with this, I, I joined to the IRC channel from Python um, in Freenode. And I asked the guys, hey, do you know how can I make my Python script run faster? And they said, do you change the algorithm? And I said, yeah, but if I have already optimized my, my algorithm as much as possible, how can I make it run even more fast? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and they say, there is no way. Then I sent them back the results of a uh, piece of code that was really optimized. It was an old benchmark. And I showed similar numbers. You know? For example, Maria. Maria is something that is really optimized. And it's checked by millions of eyes in every release. Um, they say that this is the, the faster Maria that you can have. Yeah. But if you change the, compile, the, the flags that you compile or use profiling to teach the compiler where, which are the paths that you need to take much more attention, yeah, you can run your binary way much faster. So yeah, it's possible to adapt to a cloud or a bare metal running, whatever you want. OK. Thank you. You're more than welcome. OK. So sure. So when you say profiling, uh, do you mean after profiling, find the hotspot and change the code? Or just the uh, profiling itself will help the improvement of the performance? No, I, I'm, what I mean profiling is when you do an invasive profiling. Uh, let's put in an example. You, 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 you have a source code. You need to enable with GCC, I'm going to build this source code instrumented. And inside the, the code, they put counters. And the counters will increase every time that you go through that line. It's like when you do cut coverage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you use profiling to find the host pot, then you uh, change the code to optimize it, optimizing the certain part you found. And then improve the problem? No, I don't change the code. I, I change the, bin the final binary. I, I, I'll make the, I allow the compiler to change the binary, but I don't change any source, co any line, uh, source code line. Uh, sorry, so I still cannot understand. So how can the binary be changed? Who, who is changing the binary? The compiler. And, and OK, let me give you an example. Imagine that you have a piece of code with multiple variables or, or different variables. The compiler cannot detect if in the heap, he will put x uh, or y or c closer to your instruction. 
So in assembly, you can have jumps and inside there, but then the, in the heap, they can put the one that you use more, let's say that you use a variable 10,000 times, okay? So that you can, they can put that piece of variable, that variable into your binary closer to the execution line that it's needed. So the jumps at the end in the execution time are faster. So this is all automatically uh, handled by the compiler? Yes, sir. Okay, cool, yes, thank that's, you. That's the, that's the good thing, that you don't have to change in the line of code. Okay. Oh, go, go. Um, you mentioned uh, Python, and um, you, in your example you used R and vectorization. Are there other things that apply more to interpreted languages or, or that kind of speed up that might be more typical of what we're doing in OpenStack? Yes. Or? Yes, I'm, we are doing, we, we did that experiment for AWK. We are doing the experiments for Perl. We're doing this, we also enable invasive profiling for PHP, and we gain 15% of performance with the PHP benchmark. So we, um, we enable, we actually enable many of the LAMP things. We enable PHP, we enable Maria, we enable, we, we improve the performance of Apache by 35%. Something like that. Amazing profiling. You can improve the performance of Apache server by 35, 40%. And we're missing, Python is a little bit tricky because the way that it is compiled is, is not <laughs> as friendly for compiler guys as I thought. But yeah, we're working on the profiling. Uh, there are some examples that we have that actually, with invasive profiling, you can enable, you can enable in Python by itself. When you, build, when you build Python by hand, not, not when you do sudo apt get, when you build it by hand, there is an option that say make um, opt args. And actually that thinks build Python instrumented, run an, in, an internal benchmark, and then give you the latest Python after that, that optimization. And that gives around 12 to 20% performance improvement. So most of the results from the from the, the benchmarking or the uh, performance counting um, result in code changes. Um, results not that's a good thing. Because, okay. because I'm trying to differentiate the you know the GCC six optimizations versus you know profiling an existing application yeah. and collecting data and fixing fixing optimizations that could have been done you know without the GCC six or taking advantage of AVX or um, the other. You know. Yeah, that's a great, a great, great question. Uh, before GCC six, we just had the capability to do profiling in an invasive way. Okay. After GCC, actually, after, after the latest version of GCC five, but I'm going to make the commercial for GCC six. Uh, now we have the capability to do not invasive profiling. Okay, maybe I, I, I do not, I was not clear. Before GCC, latest version of GCC, yes, you can do profiling even in Python with even uh, GCC 4.8, okay, that's fine. But the question is, it's a nightmare, you know? It's like the example that I give with the huge pencil in the back of the, of the guy. It's really painful because imagine that you're building an operating system or even that you're building the Python for your own open stack. You have to build your Python first instrumented, then run the benchmark, and then compile again, and then deploy the thing. So with the other way, you forget about it. You just put some specific counters, you gather once, and once you have the information, you send that information to the compiler, and the compiler try to guess, try to guess what are the, the, the benefits, what are the, the, the paths that the, that the benchmark are executing more, and then just deploy it. But you have to compile one more, one time less, okay? That is one of the advantage of the GCC five point something, will be in six, yeah. So, so continuing on that question, right? Sure. So you have to compile once and you uh, save that data and pass that to compiler, then the second time you compile, you compile the final image, right? And, but if, if you have different program, then you have to repeat that process again. Right? Yes. So otherwise, compiler will reuse the, old, the data for the other set of program. And in, that is for invasive profiling, and that is why it's a nightmare. In my case, when I, have, when I receive a mail that says, oh, guess what, Victor? There is a new version of Python, or a new version of PHP, or a new version of Maria, and I say, oh my god. I have to go compile instrumented, by, compile instrumented, run the benchmark, gather the information, and recompile again. 
with the not invasive thing that we did for AWK, I mean, AWK is not changing in that much anyway, but uh, the good thing is that um, with that other technology, you forget about it. You just compile as usual, but you just pass the compiler a flag that say, oh, by the way, use these counters and try to guess where the, the best path is. And doesn't matter if the, chain, the, search chains go, uh, the, the, the source code changes. It doesn't matter. But if the source code changes, the counters should change too, right? Not really. Let me give you... Um, here. Okay. Auto FDO, just to put in names, is the not in basic. PGO is the one that is in basic. How does this counter work? Not in an analogy, but really in a technical word. Okay. Intel architecture has one feature and that's hardware counters, and the kernel also has software counters. How many of you has used the, the tool perf? Okay, what does perf do internally? They try to track the performance, the, the counters of what are, how, how the application is behaving inside, right? And they use hardware and kernel counters to give you that information. Those are exactly the same counters that out have you use. Okay, there is a really amazing tutorial of how does auto FDO work. Um, here, okay, an amazing tutorial, and that will show you how Perf is run, is using that counters, passing that counters to the compiler, and that is fine. Why doesn't why doesn't matter if the source code changes? It's a really great question. It's a really good question. The answer is the counters doesn't, is, is not associated with a line of code, okay? The counters are just activated because the benchmark was running in the hardware and in the kernel. So there is no association or direct association with this counter and this line of code. Doesn't matter. In the other way, when you instrument the binary, you have a direct association with the results of the path that you are tracking with a line of code. It's like when you get code coverage. You have, two, uh, you have two binaries. The one that you are execution and another thing that is tracking the lines that are executed. But it's correlated, both of them. And in the coders, they are not correlated. The problem is that the compiler has to guess. I, they call it heuristic. I call it guessing. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Yep. Great question. Any other questions? Great questions, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sure. No? Okay. Thank you.